Η δόκτωρα Γεωργοπούλου γεννήθηκε και στην Ελλάδα, έχει σπουδάσει σε αρχαιολογία και ιστορία στο Πανεπιστήμιο Αθηνών, στη Σορβόνη. Διδακτορικό τη είναι στην ιστορία τη τέχνη στο University of California, Los Angeles. Έχει επιτελέσει καθηγήτρια δέξε πάρα πολλά χρόνια στο Yale, περισσότερα από 10, αν θυμάμαι καλά, όπου έχει και πολύ συμβολή ουσιαστικά ίδρυση το πρόγραμμα ελληνικών σπουδών, το οποίο παραμένει ένα από τα πιο σημαντικά κέντρα ελληνική γλώσσα και πολιτισμού στον κόσμο. Και από το 2004 διευθύνει τη Γενάδη Βιβλιοθήκη. Αν δεν κάνω λάθο, είναι η μικροβιότερη διευθύντρια. Πολλέ φορέ σε ένα business που προσπαθούμε να βρούμε από φίτη μα που έχουν μείνει στην ίδια επιχείρηση και οργανισμό περισσότερα από πέντε χρόνια και δεν μπορούμε. Σε 15 χρόνια πλέον έχουν αλλάξει πέντε εταιρείε, εκτό αν είναι οικογενειακή. Επομένω, το γεγονό ότι έχει μια πορεία 15 ετών, νομίζω ότι έχει μια πολύ καλή οπτική και μνήμη πώ έχει εξελιχθεί αυτό ο οργανισμό. Και ε, την καλέσαμε σήμερα να μα μιλήσει για μια βιβλιοθήκη που ίσω θα μπορούσε να πει κανεί ω επιστημονική βιβλιοθήκη. Δεν θα είχε πολλά ερίσματα κίνητρα να είναι πολύ εξωστρεφή και πολύ ανοιχτή στην τεχνολογία ή στην κοινοτομία. Αλλά γεννάει ω κάνει μόνο ακριβώ αντίθετα. Είναι μια βιβλιοθήκη που ανοίγει στον κόσμο, προσπαθεί να προσεγγίσει ένα μεγαλύτερο κοινό, προσπαθεί να φέρει στου χώρου τι διαφορετικέ εκφράσει και εκφάνσει τη κοινωνία. Έχει πω πολλά παλιά έγγραφα και βιβλία τα οποία φυλάσσει, αλλά από ό,τι θα μα πει και η Μαρία σε λίγο, είναι ανοιχτή και στην εξέλιξη τεχνολογία, στην ψηφιακή τεχνολογία και πώ επηρεάζει τη λειτουργία μια βιβλιοθήκη, εξελίσσεται. Και κάτι που είναι πολύ χρήσιμο σε εμά, επειδή δεν είναι ένα εμπορικό οργανισμό που να έχει άμεσε πιέσει από το ανταγωνιστικό τη περιβάλλον, να κοινοτομήσει, ε, ό,τι η πρωτοβουλία, η κοινοτομία ε, προέρχεται από εκεί, κυρίω έχει να κάνει με κάποιε αποφάσει διοικητικέ, εκπροέσει των ανθρώπων από τη δικό του. Και αυτό μα επιτρέπει να δούμε έτσι πάρα πολύ καθαρά, σε μια πολύ καθαρή έκθεση, αυτό που ονομάζουμε δημιουργική ηγεσία, κάποιε αποφάσει, οι οποίε είναι πολύ σημαντικέ. Uh, και εν μέρη έχουν να κάνουν και με το πώ οι άνθρωποι ειδικούν οργανισμού, βλέπουν και το μέλλον και την ταυτότητά του. Οπότε είμαστε πάρα πολύ χαρούμενοι που την υποδεχόμαστε σήμερα uh, στο ΑΜΠΑ και το βήμα είναι δικό σα. Very nice to be here uh, and for the first time as a speaker. So thank you, Bobby. Uh, and uh, I will start with, uh, with a video. Uh, about the Gennadios Library so that uh, you don't have to uh, listen to me uh... They say that nothing is more difficult to predict than the past and uh, how we view the past uh, depends on the questions that we ask Everything that's happening now has happened before in different ways and it's preserved here at the Gennady. People knock on my office door and they're holding one of the books and they say, look what I found. The Gennadios Library opened its doors to the public in 1926. Many of the books are uh, rare materials uh, that were part uh, of the private collection of John Gennadios a Greek uh, who was ambassador in London uh, in the later part of the 19th century. With the foundation of the Gennadios, it is the, the whole scope of the American school that changed. Uh, that in fact, it doesn't stop with the end of antiquity as other institutions do, but it continues and strives to actually understand and study and, and gather materials for the history of Greece through the ages. The library is a place that is fascinating with uh, all the treasures that it has. We have the Byzantine manuscript that was written uh, in Asia Minor in the 1240s. The first printed edition of uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer, which was printed in Florence in 1488. The first printed edition of Erotokritos, uh, which is uh, a, a poem uh, and, and theatrical play that uh, was written uh, in Crete. Wonderful travelers' uh, books, French, German, British, who came uh, to Greece. We have the papers of Heinrich Schliemann, the papers of uh, George Zephyrus, Odysseus Elitis. But also we have expanded our modern Greek literature collection to more recent literary generations. Dimitri Metropolis, a colossal conductor, on the level of Toscanini. We have his archives here at the uh, Gennadium. 
to see the, the history of Greece and of Hellenism preserved here the way it is, of course, it's fantastic to me as a Greek American. Uh, and I have to ask myself, how can I, what can I do to help that? We try to find funding to digitize our collections. The digital library is a world to be discovered. There are things uh, and mysteries and secrets that are hidden in there. You can teach a class in the United States and you can see live what we have here in our collections. We have lectures and symposia and exhibitions uh, that attract a wider public. And this has brought more collections and, and more materials into the library. We have opened the library to younger people. It's amazing to see young people interested in Greek history. We discover new treasures that we didn't knew existed. I think it's astonishing that the Gennadius houses the most amazing personal items in the possession of Lord Byron, a long-lasting figure for the 19th century. This combination of the most monumental, but at the same time human aspect of his life is of itself what makes Gennadius unique, but also what drives scholars and philologists in their approach to the past. They study the Greek world, which is much bigger than, than Greece. The Gennadius is the best library in the world for post-Byzantine Greek history. This is a place where I am comfortable. This is a place where people understand what I am doing. It's impossible to study the classical past without being aware of how that past was studied in the 19th century. It's impossible to move from the French Revolution to the more radical and democratic politics of the mid-century if you don't examine what happens in the support of the Greek Revolution for independence. All these questions are vital today. I think it's important that uh, Greeks and people worldwide know Makarianis' contributions as an unselfish patriot who fought valiantly for the independence of Greece. The Makarianis' wing, together with these beautiful grounds, will enable the Yenadios to have a dialogue with the broader community, enriching our understanding of the Hellenic world from antiquity up until the present day. So, um, what I tried to do with this five-minute video is actually have other people and plus myself tell the story of what the Yenadios Library is. And uh, what, uh, what I would like uh, to, to do in, in this presentation is to sort of divide it uh, in four different parts, speak about the collections or the past, if you will, what, what I found and what is there and what we're, what we're doing with this then the mission of the library, uh, which is an educational mission, uh, and then uh, to think and, and understand and, and expose, in a sense, and present to you how we have uh, decided uh, and, and managed to open the library with smaller steps and with sort of larger steps uh, into uh, the sort of more general public, and, uh, and, and finish uh, with uh, the future, with uh, things that uh, lie ahead, or I think, and I hope I understand that uh, they lie ahead, uh, and, and hopefully then uh, we can uh, have uh, a discussion. So I start with uh, two slides uh, that, um, uh, in a sense, go back to the collections. Uh, and the foundation of the library, and this is the private con collector, John Yenadios, who was born in Athens in 1844 and uh, lived uh, most of his life in London as ambassador. And uh, during his time in London, uh, he 
uh, was uh, compelled, uh, I believe, by the fact that the British in the 1860s and 70s were infatuated by ancient Greece but did not care about modern Greece. He wanted to make, a, a, to make and put together a collection that will show the British that the modern Greeks were almost as important as their forebearers. And of course, how did he try to do this? By collecting books. Uh, archives, manuscripts, uh, maps, uh, works of art that showed, in fact, that uh, Hellenism did not die with, uh, in, in classical Athens, that it survived. It changed through Byzantium and through the modern period, uh, and uh, it, uh, it, it, of course, it, during his time, uh, Greece was, going, was trying to become a modern uh, nation. Uh, of course, Yenadios, being an ambassador, was also involved uh, in the idea, in the Megali idea, in the ideas of, of uh, what was happening as uh, the Ottoman world uh, was uh, sort of starting to, to collapse. Uh, and all this is very important. But what is, of course, uh, interesting for the Yenadios is that uh, uh, Ioannis Yenadios decided in 1922 to leave his collection to the American school with the proviso that the school would actually build a new building for the library, for his library, which would be named Togenadion in memory of his father. Now, the, the things that uh, one finds in the, in the library, the rare things that one finds in the library, I think <laughs> it's best to call them relics for the past and sort of very important, almost sacred relics. And I have here the first edition of, of Homer, the first printed edition from Florence, and the wreath that uh, the Greeks of Missolonghi put on, on, on Lord Byron's uh, tomb. You can imagine there are many more things. I just chose these two because I think they're emblematic of, of what uh, the, the collections are. So when you come in as director of, of uh, a place like this, uh, a place that is geared to scholars, to uh, young people who do their dissertations and professors, uh, the first thing that uh, you feel is awe. Uh, in my case, so the first time I went into the library and I used the library, I was writing my dissertation, so I knew what it had, everything it had about Venetian Crete. This is what I was writing my dissertation of, on. But when I arrived as director, of course, I had to think more broadly. I had to understand uh, things that uh, I hadn't uh, seen and known before. And I, I tend to think of the collections as, as babies. You know, how, how do you curate them? How, how do you take care of them? You have to pamper them. You have to look at them. You have to understand them. You have to, to go close uh, and, and listen to them. And of course, uh, coming from uh, the US where I had spent uh, 18 years, uh, it, the, my question was uh, uh, to myself, I mean, what kind of, of a director I was going to be and what kind of library I wanted uh, to, to be part of. Um, I knew that, um, Uh, I knew what library I did not want to have, <laughs> and I did not want to direct. And of course, this is from the name of the rose and, and uh, the idea that you know you have this uh, sort of secrets and mysteries in the library that you you sort of ho hold very closely to to your heart, and uh, you know you you can't uh, you you shouldn't share. I mean, coming from, uh, from the US, where in fact, uh, for us in the humanities, uh, I think libraries were one of the most important things that big research universities would, were able to offer to us. Uh, what, uh, what I tried to communicate uh, to, to everyone, and you know, what I knew what the library was, was uh, the idea that uh, you would open the library uh, not freely, but you would have an open library. I vividly remember when I arrived, uh, I took my job on August 2, 2004, uh, along with the Olympics uh, in Athens, and I got into the library. We had just, the American school, the, the you know, this is part of the American school, we had just purchased a very, very expensive uh, library management system. Um, I mean, truly very expensive and, and too much for us because we're very small libraries, I mean. In, uh, and uh, I went into the library and I said, where are the terminals? The, 
the computers. And they said, in your office. And I said, okay, we have, uh, and I said, what about the public terminals? So they looked at me and they said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, we, we have invested in an online catalog. Um, you know, the people will need, the, the readers will need to access the catalog somehow. And they said, oh, don't worry. They're not going to stop using the card catalog. So, you know, it was not very easy for me. And, you know, I had been at UCLA, I mean, at Yale, in many places, I had seen the change from the card catalog to, to the computer. Uh, so uh, it was an, a, almost an uphill struggle. But, uh, you know, I was... 40 years old, a woman, uh, and, you know, I was trying to actually really tell, first of all, the librarian uh, who was about to retire uh, but needed a final push, <laughs> and the staff that, you know, this was going to change. So um, th the first thing is, you know, as I said, it, you need to take care of the collections, but you need to also know how to take care of them, and, and you need to keep up to speed with, with developments. Um, in Greece, we, did not, we don't have, we didn't have in the 20th century a, a library tradition. Uh, I think library schools opened in the 80s or 90s in, uh, in the technical universities. But uh, the thing is that uh, as we haven't grown up with, with uh, the idea of a library. So uh, to, to think about libraries and, and about the developments of libraries that had happened in the rest of the world uh, from the 60s, 70s with uh, electronic uh, developments, none of that. We didn't have any of this in Greece. So it was a very important step. Uh, to sort of start the, doing the cataloging online. All of these systems are, are similar, of course, but uh, that's very important. Um, of course, when you have a library in any library, but when you have a library with treasures, uh, another part of the curation is that you have to safeguard them. You have to preserve them. You have to make sure uh, that... Um, uh, you know, there is no theft. There is always theft in libraries, but uh, there is no major theft. The best way to do it is, of course, to have, the, I mean, as good a catalog as you can. You, you enumerate everything you have. Um, in this past year, what uh, we have uh, done is, for the first time, we have separated the rare books from the non-rare books. Uh, we have about uh, 40,000 rare books and, and about 90,000 non-rare books. And here, uh, this, um, uh, this uh, gentleman is uh, applying RFID tags to the books so that we can both inventory them better, uh, but uh, also uh, they have the sort of strip uh, for magnetic, magnetic strip uh, for security reasons. And we have now in our beautiful reading room uh, which dates from 1926. We have this this sort of doors that beep when when a book uh, goes past them. But you know what can we do? We need to to sort of uh, have this. Um, but the most important thing, of course, for any library is space. Uh, is to have enough space for your holdings. Uh, and uh, we're very lucky in the, um, at the Yenadios Library uh, that from 1995 uh, there has been a separate uh, board of directors of the library, trustees, um, who decided uh, that uh, their, the library had enough of its own um, importance so that uh, there would be special funding uh, to renovate the library. So from 99 uh, through actually this year, uh, the more or less the, the area underneath the library, the whole basement has been excavated uh, so that we have much more space for our books and archives. Um, the other thing that is extremely important, and I will, this is the, the last part of the technical things, uh, is uh, we spoke about uh, theft. Uh, a very important thing for books and paper is, of course, fire. And uh, we have a very sophisticated system of, of uh, gas, uh, uh, which in the case of uh, fire, uh, you know, the door shut and the oxygen is sucked out and the, library, the, the books are saved. Presumably, we have time to go out to get out <laughs> as humans. <laughs> uh, but you know, we, we hope the books will be saved. <laughs> uh, 
so uh, these are obviously this is the infrastructure this is you know the things that uh, these are the things that you have to do and I have been extremely lucky uh, because I arrived in the sort of at the beginning of this campaign but uh, th th there has been a momentum and uh, this has, has gone forth so that's extremely important but the library is about the users of the library it's about patrons users readers whatever we we, we want i mean we want to call them uh, so uh, i i think uh, our main philosophy uh, and uh, the, the Yanadios also houses extremely important archives, as you heard from the archivist. Uh, our main philosophy is that whatever we accept into the library as donation or what we buy, uh, it's not uh, going to go into a warehouse. Uh, we want it to be used and usable almost immediately. Uh, and so the, the way in which uh, sort of uh, people study the collection uh, is extremely important. This is the main reading room of, of the library in the case you, you haven't seen it um, and you haven't used the library. Uh, but uh, of course, this... Uh, you know, this, this was enough uh, in uh, 1926. Uh, this was enough uh, in the 90s, uh, but uh, resources, library resources have changed. Um, so what uh, our, our new, in a sense, uh, way of thinking or uh, of thinking about it is that you have the library within the library itself, but also that you have a library without walls. A library that is open, that is open to as many people as possible. Um, and uh, so this is where new technologies help. Uh, not, uh, not only um, to uh, give access to, to more people, to more uh, scholars, to more researchers, uh, but uh, also to have the duplicates of, of the things that we have, uh, just in case something happens, despite the uh, fire extinguishing systems uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, the, of course, technology uh, is about uh, going digital, is about uh, offering uh, different projects uh, to the world, um, uh, Babis already mentioned that uh, as part of the American school, uh, as part of a non-profit organization, uh, we don't charge uh, people to use the library. In fact, we don't charge local people, Greeks, to use the library. I mean, the Americans uh, who come and are members of the school, uh, they, they do pay a, a, a monthly fee. Um, but so whatever we do, we, we strive to have it open to as many people as possible. Uh, this is, of course, not always open with electronic resources where you buy them from different consortia and you have to negotiate, uh, but uh, that's a, a, a very important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, for me, when, when uh, I came into the library, uh, the one project uh, that... Um, uh, had been ongoing was an indexing of our uh, books of travels. There are many travelers who came to Greece in the, from the 15th uh, century through the 19th. And uh, I have a very uh, sort of dear colleague, a historian, who has been sort of reading the books and, and indexing them. Originally in the 90s in cards, then uh, in the computer. Um, but it's only very recently that we managed to have part of this uh, online. Um, as you, if you look at the logos, uh, you will see that uh, the logo of the Unadios Library is shared uh, with the uh, Katerini Lascaridis Foundation. So it's part of also finding uh, different and other uh, foundations, institutions, uh, sister institutions, and to move uh, forward. Uh, but uh, you know, this is uh, what we, we strive, I mean, to, and, and, and in fact, I, it would be very important, and for us it is important, to devise of projects much bigger than this that, uh, in a sense, put us on the map, not just in Greece, but in fact, I, I see the Unadios as, as, as a way, because of its American 
uh, face uh, as a way to open up Greece to uh, the world at large. Uh, uh, so digitization, uh, we, uh, we have, as you heard, I mean, amazing treasures, uh, but our way of digitizing have, has been opportunistic. Uh, so whenever there is funding, I mean, that was from 2007, a European grant from uh, the Society of Information, Kinonia des Pluroforias, we digitized several things. This is a scrapbook of John Yanavius with images from the Balkan Wars uh, that are online, indexed, and you can uh, sort of uh, go through them. Uh, the diaries uh, of Heinrich Schliemann uh, are all digitized and put uh, on the web. Uh, the, you know, the, this Schliemann was an amazing, amazing figure. He spoke 14 languages at least. He wrote uh, 12. So you, you leaf uh, through the, 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 um, uh, the excavation diaries and it's just extraordinary what you read and you know you read in english and then in german and then in greek and then in turkish and it's it's just fun so you can in, in case you cannot sleep or whatever you can go and visit <laughs> the diaries <laughs> Um, uh, also, for uh, Dimitri Mitropoulos, uh, when uh, the archives uh, were offered, uh, were, gift were donated to the Yanavios Library, uh, the, his, um, uh, his heir uh, also gave us the, the um, rights uh, to, to his work. So from uh, the um, uh, proceeds of, of uh, the works of uh, Mitropoulos, we have digitized his collection. Uh, Mitropoulos was not only um, uh, a maestro, a uh, conductor, but he was also, he wrote his, uh, his, he was also a composer. So all of these things uh, are uh, on the web uh, because it also, for us, it's very difficult to deal with all the musicians and, you know, we, 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 every time you have a new kind of archive, you need also to learn a different language <laughs> and to communicate with, with people. So, um, Obviously, this digitization uh, is important. We have a long, long, long way to go. Uh, it's, uh, and, and we'll see how we work. I mean, for, for the time being, we, we are going, to, we feel that we, we have to establish an in-house uh, um, lab uh, for uh, digitizing. Um, a very, very important uh, part uh, of, uh, of uh, what we do uh, is uh, what uh, I mentioned before, is to try to uh, find good allies and to try to find friends um, and to, to get connected with people who do important things. Um, this is something very, very uh, interesting uh, and very librarian-like. Uh, uh, it's a database uh, of uh, books that were printed uh, in Europe, that were printed in the 15th century. Uh, and this is a consortium uh, that, uh, out of Oxford that uh, received uh, very generous funding from the European Union to catalog all the books uh, that were printed and, and circulated all the copies of books uh, in the 15th century. They've cataloged about 70,000 books, and they, with a very uh, sort of interesting algorithms, now you can sort of figure out where the book was printed and where it has gone in the 500-year history. And you can actually find out, I mean, wonderful things. We are part of it, and we're very proud that we're part of it. Of course, they are very eager to have uh, the Greek incunabula. Uh, these are the incunables. These are the, the books that are printed in the 15th century. Uh, so we are now part uh, of this consortium trying to understand uh, how uh, these uh, things work and how we can be, uh, as I said, part uh, of this new way of uh, visualizing uh, things. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, to have open doors, to have open collections, uh, you you can share them. One imagines uh, with with your immediate um, uh, public and audience. Uh, but uh, what I strive for, and what I would like to do more of, is to share them with with young people. I mean, even children. Um, 
What is very important uh, is that uh, I think back in the 90s, there was fear that if you digitized and you put things uh, up on the web freely, the libraries would have no audience, no public. Well, this has proven to be totally wrong. And there are more people who come to the libraries, uh, maybe because things are di digitized or who knows why, uh, but digitization has not on the contrary, digitization has helped uh, the libraries. Uh, and here is, uh, we had uh, these uh, kids from a primary school in Brooklyn, uh, not all of them Greek, but a Hellenic primary school in Brooklyn, who came last year to uh, look at things from uh, the uh, disaster of 1922, from the Asia Minor uh, disaster. And uh, here is a map uh, of, uh, of Smyrna from probably the 1820s. Uh, it doesn't have a date, which we have manipulated uh, digitally because it, it actually shows the different communities uh, in Smyrna. And the kids were actually very uh, interested both in, in the, 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 the digital image, but also, and I think this is what is important uh, for me, is to understand that the kids are excited about the physical things. And when you tell them you cannot touch, uh, because I'm the librarian, the, I'm the only one who can touch it, they pay attention. And actually, I was just looking again at this image on the right, and the mothers uh, who came with the kids seem to have less interest <laughs> in what we show <laughs> than the children themselves. But it's uh, the, the, the access to the physical object uh, is something extremely important. Now, whether it is the smell of the book uh, or things that um, uh, my generation uh, is very keen uh, uh, or, or not uh, is, is another story. Uh, but, you know, how, how do you really bring the children uh, to to this material. I mean, you can't really show them, I mean, give them something that is fragile and, and let them play with it. Um, so we have uh, one way of, of uh, that we've done this is to digitize, we've digitized about 20 of our books with uh, sort of commentary. And this is a, a manuscript of the 15th century with um, uh, islands from the Aegean. And uh, these two kids, we were open that uh, on for an evening and so the library was didn't have any normal readers, and and these kids, I mean, I, I they couldn't stop playing with it, and and uh, it was it was truly wonderful. Or um, what uh, what what I've tried to do, and what I think is extremely important, and and this is partly because I was a teacher, even though I was teaching university kids, uh, is to actually uh, show and do something, and ask kids to do something that is unexpected. Uh, surprising, fun. Uh, so last year, uh, this is uh, from a library in, in New York. Uh, they asked at some point, do you have anything to, uh, to color in uh, 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 for, for kids? Or, and, and you know, we sent them, uh, this is an album uh, from somebody who came to Athens uh, in the early 1800s, and this is a Greek wedding, so we sent some of those. Or uh, what uh, we did uh, recently is um, we have uh, uh, a new area now in, uh, just above our museum, uh, and we wanted to do something for the uh, for uh, as a sitting area and. Uh, uh, we were discussing with a company in Thessaloniki, and uh, they said, well, do you have something that you would like to put uh, on, on these seats? And I said, well, you know, we have the Harta of Rigas, which uh, the, the Harta of Rigas is, a, uh, is made up of 12 pieces because it was printed in pieces. Uh, and I said, well, why don't we do that? I mean, have these blocks. And then in the summertime, there, was, there were these Greek-American kids who came, and we needed to do some kind of, of uh, game or activity. And I said, well, we'll just make them put together the heart of Riga. So, you know, I mean, this is not extremely serious. But on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, you can, uh, it, it makes us sort of get out of, of our frame of mind and, and get out of what we do every day. Uh, and maybe not be so serious, uh, but uh, sometimes it, it's important maybe for 
uh, for, for sort of younger people and all of that. So, um, outreach. How does a library whose mission is to educate um, educators and to educate uh, sort of uh, scientists and scholars, how does the library open up to the world or, I mean, how, how, how does it gain a new public? Um, and uh, this is uh, our campus uh, of, of the Yenavios Library, so this is the original library. Uh, of 1926. There were two wings that were added to it in the 70s. Uh, and then uh, in 2005, we added an auditorium. Uh, and uh, in 2018, <laughs> we added uh, this uh, new uh, museum. So uh, this is the campaign that uh, I have been talking about. And of course, what uh, all of this, I mean, the, the, the exterior face of this uh, is uh, for outreach. But as I mentioned before, I mean, the, the substratum is uh, there are two basements for books. So we, we are on sturdy foundations, and Mount Likavitos has a lot of books <laughs> in its uh, bowels. Um, so we do, in terms of, of outreach, the usual things and very, very traditional things that uh, you would expect uh, a library to do. We have lectures, we have conferences. Uh, this was uh, a film on the Balkan Wars from 1912-13 that was presented in February, uh, a film that was recently sort of uh, uh, discovered in the archives uh, at uh, UCLA. Um, we have concerts. Um, that uh, are sort of funded by the Schwartz Foundation. Uh, we uh, mount our own exhibitions, uh, and uh, this was an exhibition on a book uh, on, uh, on the flora of Greece, on flora greca, and we had a lot of activities around it. Um, but uh, we also uh, had uh, in uh, 2014, and uh, also a little bit earlier than that, we had exhibitions that were a little bit different. Um, exhibitions that, in a sense, tried to break away from what the library does uh, in order to bring different people into the library. And uh, this is the second video that uh, I'm going to show. Um, and this is, I think, a very defi this was a very defining moment uh, for uh, the way we were doing things uh, in the Yenavios. And I will sort of play the video from uh, the Neon uh, Foundation. Immediately, I left this place. It's fantastic to... to uh, sit down and to read and to, to be alone with your thoughts and these things. Poetry is in general characterized like uh, it is epic. It is timeless. It is quite an, a, a different time capsule. You can walk around, you can come to the center. So in some way, like a labyrinth, the classical labyrinths have only one certain pattern. It feels like a, a homecoming because a lot of my uh, sculpture starts from uh, Greek sculpture and it's nice to see them back at home. You walk down, you start seeing these tables which are very much archaeological tables and then you start questioning where these sculptures are from. Within a multiple, you see an object many times. You can't really focus on the one object. You, still, you start moving, and that movement of your eye and makes you think of other things. So I try and build these relationships with, with these situations which the viewer can kind of tap into, which become his situation. I mean, I don't consider myself a sculptor. I don't have any, even though I have interests in regards to matter and I have a lot of opinions on how matter should be treated, I'm more interested in the gaps, I mean, the space in between one object and the other and the relations you, 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 you create. I mean, 
when I was doing this series of works, I was trying to work from the perspective of a sort of post-human being or non-human being that could, you know, would come back to Earth maybe and reuse human culture as a sort of ready-made or found object, or, I mean like a library. Many, many, not all, but many of my projects uh, are placed in the outside, in non-conventional spaces. Yeah, I certainly was thinking about the ancient speakers of Roman um, Greece, and the, but to me they're not only wise, they're slightly foolish, they're kind of spindly, they're slightly ridiculous, and um, they're sort of pointing out places, but maybe you don't know where to. The, um, even though these pieces are bronze, they were made originally in Balata. I sculpted it underwater, I heat it up in hot water, and I sculpted it under cold water, and as it sets, it hardens. That's why they're quite um, free. Artists from different generations and using different methodologies, but sharing the focus of the library and the gardens and the bigger idea of knowledge. The Gennadius Library and Gardens is a fantastic site to bring together the legacies of Greek civilization and contemporary art. It's an amazing meeting point. A Thousand Doors comes from Borges, the great um, Argentinian writer, who of course conceived of a sort of a utopian library, a fictional library, uh, which was infinite. There is that famous story that when the Mongols came and they destroyed Baghdad, they emptied out the libraries and they, um, they made a bridge with the books um, to go across the, uh, the Tigris River. And they say that the Tigris River flowed black for months afterwards because of all the ink coming off of the books. Θέλω να δημιουργήσω αυτό το πράγμα, ένα χώρο που να υπάρχουν και εκτός από τα πουλιά που υπάρχουν ήδη εκεί, να υπάρχουν και, τα, ε, και μια συμφωνία από πουλιά που θα έχω ενεργιστρώσει εγώ. Πιστεύω ότι και η απεσιοδοξία, όπως και η αισιοδοξία, προσωπικά πιστεύω ότι είναι το ίδιο ψευδεστησιακές καταστάσεις. Αλλά εάν έχω να προτείνω κάτι, είναι αισιοδοξία. Εδώ που καθόμαστε είμαστε μέσα σε ένα κομμάτι που λέγεται conversation piece, κομμάτι συνομιλίας. Είναι από αυτά τα έργα της σύγχρονης τέχνης που μπορεί να προκαλέσουν. Ο νέων θέλει να δώσει την ευκαιρία σε χώρους που δεν είναι απαραίτητος παραδοσιακοί χώροι έκθεσης της σύγχρονης τέχνης, σε δημόσιους χώρους, σε ανοιχτούς, ελεύθερα, στο ευρύ κοινό, να έρθει σε επαφή με τη σύγχρονη τέχνη, να ξεφοβηθεί. This exhibition is open daily for two months and it's free of charge. It offers, I hope, a fantastic opportunity for the people of Athens and for tourists to the city to come and engage in some of the most important work being produced in contemporary art today from around the world. So um, this, as I said, was a, a truly a defining moment. I mean, uh, what uh, Dimitris Daskalopoulos said, uh, to actually bring art that is not what you expect in a place that uh, is not made for it. Uh, and uh, this, this amazing figure, I mean, who had sort of dropped from heaven, whatever he was, uh, he looked like an astronaut. Uh, it, it was truly sort of crazy to have it uh, in, 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 the, in the gardens of the Gennadios. But uh, what was important for me, I mean, I'm, obviously I love my, my job, and, uh, but I also am an academic, and I think that uh, the most important thing that you can bring to your job is, is your inner sort of truthfulness and, and uh, you know, you, you need to be who you are and not change and, and not, um, 
you know, say things that, uh, the, uh, that you don't believe. So when I came upon this, uh, this opportunity to have this exhibition, which was a very interesting, I mean, I, I, I had met Elina Kunduri, who is the, the, the uh, executive director of uh, NEON, and they were going to have this amazing exhibition in the National uh, Gardens of Athens. And I had said how wonderful and everything. And then all of a sudden she called me one Saturday and she said, we don't have the National Gardens. Can I bring this exhibition to the Inavios? <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> You know, I need to bring this up with the director of the American School, with the trustees. And, you know, I, for me it was fear and trepidation. I knew I wanted it to happen primarily because Ivona Blaswick told me that uh, what they would bring was uh, Louis Bourgeois, the, the, the spider, the big spider. And I had seen this in Tate Modern and I thought, my goodness, we'll put this in front of the Yanavis. <laughs> the work didn't come. Uh, but to my amazement, uh, and this is what, uh, I, I don't know if one can call it luck. I mean, it's, it's truly luck for me to work where I work, is that uh, the director said, okay, we'll bring, the, bring it to the trustees. And the trustees said, fine. Uh, so, but, but it was, a, a, you know, it, it, it was a difficult thing to, to decide, I think, for all of us. Uh, so one way to, I mean, one was the, the, the one issue were the things that were outside the library. Uh, but, you know, it's in the gardens. The other thing is that we had a true invasion of, of, of uh, works of art and people in the library with our normal, normal readers. There is noise, there is disturbance. On Saturday mornings, there were uh, kids in, in, in strollers who were screaming. You know, it was not easy. Um, and, you know, this is where one needs to think about bind boundaries and, and, you know, how far you push it. Uh, and I think that's uh, something uh, that I learned uh, from, uh, from, from this exhibition. Um, so we open, uh, if we want to open uh, to a larger um, um, amount of people, we open in the evening. This was an event uh, for Atenistas. And we are not, of course, the only ones. Uh, this is a trend now. I mean, the outreach, exostrefia, is, is something that we all use. Um, interestingly, you know, if, if you think of the new libraries uh, that actually have have uh, been built all around the world, but also very close to home. Uh, this is what they strive for. They strive for people, people, people. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, the, uh, the, uh, a reference to uh, a book on, on the, the, the new uh, Nyarkos, uh, Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Cultural Center. To me, it's interesting also. I mean, what we have in Faliro is a cultural center. It's not just the library. Uh, it's, it's almost as if sometimes the idea of a library is becomes enveloped into something else or you call it something else because library is, not, is a bad word. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and of course, if you think of the Yanavius with its sort of very stately neoclassical sort of heavy building next to that. Uh, but I was uh, recently um, uh, in, uh, in uh, Lefkosia, in, uh, in Cyprus, in Nicosia, where uh, the new... Uh, University Library of Jean Nouvel uh, was uh, was just uh, I think it, it opened in December, uh, and uh, this is called a Hill of Knowledge. It's it's an amazing building. It's truly amazing because you have light coming in. Uh, unfortunately, the five days I was there, it was uh, raining constantly, <laughs> but still you could uh, you could you could feel uh, the the dynamism of this building. But, you know, these also uh, are, are, are sort of temples to an architect. Uh, they are not uh, just shelves for books uh, because, you know, I mean, for me, library is a book uh, or, or a computer or a digital resource. But, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's the books and the users. So we have this sort of new trend. Uh, and then the other day I was uh, also, uh, I saw this, uh, this uh, new, uh, this image of this new uh, library at the University of Athens up in Zografu, which I have not visited yet. Um, and uh, of course uh, now it's uh, sort of uh, uh, 
this new library of, uh, of, for those of you who have been to the University of Athens, you know that, uh, you know, there were very few libraries and, and separate libraries, so now there's this new one. But the, the focus, again, is that it's accessible to all, not just the students. So accessibility and outreach uh, is, is important. Um, I'm not, you know, and, and it depends on how we, we do it. Um, one last thing be before I get into the future um, uh, has to do with, of course, how, how do you do all this and how do you manage to open up uh, how do you have a new exhibition space? Um, and of course, uh, it has to do with uh, strong supporters. I mean, you have to be very clear in what uh, you ask for. Uh, of course, uh, as an institution grows, you need to have a development office. Uh, for those of you who have worked with uh, development officers and, and fundraising, you would know that the relationship is somewhat iffy at times. It's not always easy. Um, for us, the administrators, uh, you know, very often they tell you, give me something so I can get you money, or, you know, you have the money, but uh, th there are, it's, it's bound with different constraints. So you have to work uh, with that. You, I, I'm, I believe that uh, in whatever we do, we have, we have to really have to be open to ideas and to uh, work uh, with uh, with uh, things um, very deeply and not be swayed uh, by the trend of the moment. Having said this, uh, on June 2nd, uh, 2018, uh, I'm sorry, 2019 has not happened yet. <laughs> Um, we inaugurated uh, our new exhibition space at the Yanavius, uh, and uh, here you see me with uh, the director of the American School, Jennifer Niles, uh, the American ambassador, and the major donor to the exhibition, Dino Macricostas, to the exhibition space, uh, Dino Macricostas. And Dino Macricostas is a Greek American, and uh, he's from uh, a small village uh, in. Um, uh, near where Macrigianis was born, uh, in Fokiva. Uh, and uh, his, uh, uh, his, his wish was that we, uh, we name the building after Ioannis Macrigianis, which is very good. I managed to, to have them drop the word general uh, from the facade of the building. I don't know if I did well, but I thought general Macrigianis somehow it was... Uh, uh, you know, maybe too much. Um, but of course, I mean, Dino, he's, he's lovely and uh, his son is lovely, but he, of course, wants uh, two of our, uh, of the paintings of Ioannis Macrigianis. Uh, these were, this is the first exhibition that we have, and two of these paintings that are quite important, and we have them in the library, that two of these 24 paintings would always be on view in this exhibition space. So all of these, you know, are small or bigger headaches. And, uh, you know, you, you, you say yes to some and you don't. But uh, for me, the, my, my relationship with the development officer is, is, <laughs> is one that you, you have to, to really make sure that um, you, you speak uh, in, in the same terms. And of course, you can have actors uh, and, and artists uh, within, uh, within the space. Um, what uh, we are also extremely lucky, I mean, to be in Athens. Uh, you wouldn't know it today, but Athens is relatively small. I mean, the distances are not that huge. We can all go and see and meet in person very important people. I mean, it's not, uh, it, it's not hard. So if I'm convinced that if you have sort of good programs, if you have important things. Uh, to to offer to the public, the public knows it, and uh, they start following you. Um, there is one, at least one thing that we have not done well, and actually is the interview with your colleague that uh, sort of uh, made me start thinking about it. And he said, "So what do you do to develop your audience?" I <laughs> said, "Well, <laughs> you know, we have good programs." <laughs> But I'm sure there are many things that we can learn from marketing and, and, you know, things that for us are skills that we don't, 
we, we shy away from because maybe, I mean, we, we believe it's not our job or it's beyond our capacity. So, the future, how to balance, how to strike a balance. Uh, the slide is because I'm a failed dancer. <laughs> Uh, thankfully, I knew it early on in life that I was better in books with books <laughs> than on point shoes. Um, but finding a balance is extremely important. And as you all know, I mean, you have different audiences with whom you have to communicate, that you have to persevere and to negotiate, trustees, uh, sort of su supervisors, staff, audience, uh, your own conscious, peers. Uh, so it's extremely important. Uh, in our case, uh, for instance, all of our trustees, one way or another, at some point or another, tell us, and where is this coffee shop? When are we going to have <laughs> the bookstore? And you know, we are up on Suivia Street. I don't think it's <laughs> the, you know, the, the place where everybody will come. But you know, it's, it's uh, you know, they say, well, the Benaki Museum has done very well. Obviously they have, but I'm not in the coffee shop business. <laughs> so anyway, I'm uh, showing an amazing place. And obviously, I mean, all these are amazing things. So one can do and can go very different directions. Um, but I think what is extremely challenging, important, fascinating, being in, a, in the library, uh, in a library or in a university at, at this time uh, is actually what is happening with uh, artificial intelligence in, and digital humanities. I mean, these are the big words uh, that uh, we hear. I'm not, I, I and my generation, I think we don't exactly know what these things are. Um, I grew up with pen and pencil you know, I still print things. Um, so how to appreciate what this is bringing, uh, how these new technologies uh, using algorithms uh, uh, to uh, do better than the human mind, uh, how all this changes uh, the way, not only of, of the, the way we, we see things, uh, but also on how we do research. So the idea of big data uh, is a very important one. I'm showing this uh, image uh, of uh, the time machine uh, because it's something that is uh, dear to my heart and uh, we're sort of getting um, closer uh, into trying to decipher his the, the historical past and archival material from early on. Uh, but this started uh, five or six years ago by uh, Frederick Kaplan, who is uh, uh, at the uh, Polytechnical School in, in Lausanne, uh, and he's uh, a you know, computer scientist. I don't know what, what his for formation is. Uh, he's an engineer of, of some sort. Um, and the big project that they started was called Time Machine Venice. So they have digitized 80 million, uh, 80 million uh, of uh, kilometers of written materials in the Renaissance. Uh, the Venetian archives where I've worked, I mean, have material from the 12th century through the, the end of the 18th century. Uh, so they've digitized this and, and through these different algorithms, they've managed to put into the equation the, the, the time uh, component. So. Presumably, uh, you know, the Venetians had these ships that went around the Mediterranean. Presumably, you can say, you knew there was an earthquake in Corfu in, I don't know, July 1st, uh, 1516. Uh, and you can plug this number in and they would tell you what ship was going there, how many people were on the ship. I mean, all the information that we have. To me, this is extraordinary. Uh, it's, uh, but, the, so, so the Venice machine is um, done, and now they're trying to have this big data set uh, uh, actually to go with for many European uh, cities and to have this uh, time machine project, which uh, will uh, actually where different cities will will participate. I don't know that Athens will make it. I, you know, I'm, and obviously the Genadios is not big enough 
to, to do this. But uh, it's, uh, it's quite extraordinary and fascinating. Uh, and then I clicked further on uh, to see what other things they're doing. And what struck me, and uh, I almost became uh, sort of started to cry, is that under each uh, sort of little image, it says six minutes of reading, three minutes of reading. <laughs> and, you know, it, it is actually, it's, it's an irony, right? I mean, you use artificial intelligence to transcribe documents better than a historian. <laughs> but you don't have more than three minutes <laughs> to read the description. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, my vision is not to be left behind. I mean, to be part of this world. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I, I'm part also of a world where the human mind and, you know, asking the right questions, being a historian, understanding the past, uh, using <laughs> what I have, soft skills, is also important. Uh, so this is this is uh, th this is the true challenge I think that lays ahead, and uh, I wanted. Uh, this is my penultimate image. Is a dear colleague who is a professor at the University of Corfu in uh, the Onion University, uh, who actually just before the National Library was going to move into the new center, uh, he went uh, into uh, the stacks uh, and uh, he actually looked for rare books in the stacks and he found many, many more because, of course, now that they were moving them. And uh, Yanis Kokonas, I mean, in, in his overalls and, uh, you know, sort of hugging the book uh, is to me the, the sort of paramount uh, um, counterpoint uh, to the image uh, of, of the time machine. So I think what libraries, what we are asked to do, and if we want to be successful, uh, is somehow to manage to marry this, uh, this uh, sort of fascinating digital future, I mean, big data and what have you, with uh, some kind of reminiscence of the past or, or, or <laughs> sort of thinking about the humanity and, and uh, the soft skills uh, that we have. Um, so that we can gain an audience, whatever this audience may be. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>